the reality is that the people in a market will absolutely lie to you. If you go to a chef and say, hey, how long does it take you to chop an onion? In this case, right? Oh man, it takes me no time. Well, what about everyone else? Oh, we're all very fast at that. And it's like a lie. I love when young founders come to me and they're like, you know, well, Mark Zuckerberg didn't even graduate. I'm like, but he got into Harvard. Let's be clear. Did you get into Harvard and decide not to go to Harvard? No, you didn't get into community college and now you're dismissing education being a thing, right? Um, I'm like, if you win, who loses? And a lot of founders have been told like, well, I mean, everyone wins. I'm like, no, 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 no. For you to win, someone must lose. So you wake up every morning trying to put them out of business. That's your goal. That's how you win, right? And like, what? What do you mean? No, I'm just going to focus on my client. I'm like, oh, no. If that is your competitor, they may not know who you are right now, but you better know who they are. You might decide to go to one of their job sites for one of their big subdivisions and show up with a food truck and talk to all their workers. And be like, hey, like, yeah, like, it's a great company, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, what do, you, what do you think they could be doing better? And they're like, oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you. As Peter Thiel says, there's been a lot of progress in the last few decades in the world of bits, but very little progress in the world of atoms. Meaning there's an excess of internet companies building software and building websites, but very few companies really building stuff in the real material world. I got to meet someone today who's changing that. KP Ready started his career as an engineer, started building startups in the late 90s, I believe. And he founded a company called Cirrus, which went on to IPO and reached a market cap of over $350 million within only two years. He's been went on to found many companies since then, and he's also become an investor. He is now the founder and general partner of Shadow VC. One of his famous portfolio companies include Icon, a famous American company that 3D prints homes within only 24 hours on a limited budget. Our conversation, we've got to talk about many things. One of those topics include how to break into what he calls unsexy industries if you're a young founder. We also talked about his advice for young founders in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, or even late 20s. How to approach coming up with ideas, mistakes that founders often make in the early stages of building a startup, building personal brands. We talked about many things, as you'll see in the episode. Something I'm always fascinated by is how people go about coming up with their ideas. Do you have any kind of frameworks you use or how do you go about thinking when you are building a startup? Yeah, I think there's a couple things you have to do. I think <clears throat> you always have to start with a really big idea and then build a logical system to like, what are the steps that I'm going to execute on to get to that, to execute on the big idea. Um, and then once you kind of chop it down into its pieces and parts, then you just have to be uh, a voracious customer discovery person, right? Like you just have to be willing to um, talk to a hundred people a month and face to face and depending on the product and what you're thinking, the, you know, what I'll say is the, the work that needs to be done is 80% about the problem. The solution's easy once you start to understand the problem and enough founders don't, you have to get infatuated with the problem and obsessed with the problem, not obsessed with the solution. And a lot, too many founders get obsessed with the solution. And I think when you obsess about the problem, you can't help but talk to a hundred people a week about the problem to get to the truth. And I always say in many ways, um, the best way to understand how to like get to the root of the one, does the problem exist? Is the problem big enough? And is it important enough? There's a lot of problems in the world. Many of those are deemed, they're, they're very large too, but they're deemed unimportant. So you have to really align the size of the problem, uh, a deep understanding of the problem with, is it keeping people up at night or is it like, yeah, it's fine. Um, and I think to do that, you just have to be an aggressive, just obsessed with understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I had one founder that told me like, Hey, they were trying to do something. They were trying to do something like in, in terms of like a robotic chef, like a robotic prep cook for back of house or restaurants. And they talked to like a hundred restaurants and they got all kinds of feedback and they still didn't feel like they were getting the right questions. So they went and worked in a restaurant for a year. Right. Cause they're like, I need to know exactly, exactly what's going on. I want to understand knife speed. I want to understand like all the, you know, cause the, the reality is that the people in a market will absolutely lie to you. They will never tell you if you go to a chef and say, Hey, how long does it take you to chop an onion in this case? Right. Oh man, it takes me no time. Well, what about everyone else? Oh, we're all very fast at that. And it's like a lie. Right. It's, it's like an outright lie. Now, whether they're disingenuously lying to you might be different than they just actually have no idea. So a lot of what you deal with when you're out doing customer discovery is you have to cut through all the hearsay and BS and obsess about it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Something, a question I've always been fascinated by is do you, you've, you've been a founder yourself, but you've also invested in quite a few founders by now. Do you think great founders are made or do you think they're born? I think founders, I think everybody has a founder in them. And, and I think there's a, there's a couple of variants around that is um, situational, right? If you, uh, I deal with a lot of people that are first time in their family, you know, immediate and extended family to go to college. So their family's looking, looking at them saying, oh, you just graduated with an engineering degree and you got a job at IBM. Fantastic, right? That's the holy grail, so to speak. So even when they have founder ideas, it's just I always tell them like, this might not be the right lifetime for you to be a founder, right? So some of it's just situational and that's just, that's just life, right? Some of it is psychological that some people just don't care. They really just don't care. Right? They, they're like, my work is my work. I get paid, I paid my mortgage. What I'm really excited about is playing the guitar. That's what I really love doing, right? But I think that person, if they get motivated, they, they could absolutely, you know. So I, so I think there is some tactical ability. Like, you know, can everybody be, um, can everybody be, you know, an, an NBA player? No, right? Why? Because there's scarcity. There's not enough slots, right? Even if you're pretty talented, there's no spot for you, right? Uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you can't play basketball. It doesn't mean you can't play in a competitive rec league. Um, so I think there's there's something about like can everybody build the next unicorn? Probably not. That is situational and that is talent. Uh, you know, it's like when I love when uh, young founders come to me and they're like, you know, well, Mark Zuckerberg didn't even graduate. I'm like, but he got into Harvard. Let's be clear. Did you get into Harvard and decide not to go to Harvard? Did you get into MIT and decide not to go to MIT? No, you didn't get into community college and now you're dismissing education being a thing, right? Um, so like there, there's a lot of those like false narratives. You know, my, my latest book um, is very focused on AI, but my last book was very focused on startup culture. It's called What You Know About Startups Is Wrong. Um, and it's just a lot of stories and debunking of startup culture, you know, things like Bill Gates. Bill Gates grew up rich. His dad was the number one patent attorney in the, in the country. Um, when he was starting out and he needed an intro to IBM, his mom was on the same board as the CEO of IBM. So he didn't grind it out. Like, I mean, he's a very talented person, obviously. But he had access that not everybody has access to. Um, you know, the founders of YouTube, one of the guys, his father-in-law was the co-founder of Netscape. And knew everyone and had money and could say like, well, if you don't invest in them, I'm gonna invest in them, right? So uh, I really try to debunk a, a lot of these ideas that these people came from nowhere and came from humble beginnings. There's very few people that have come from humble beginnings. 
um, to found these companies. And so, you know, I think, does that mean, you know, not everybody needs to be a founder of a billion dollar company. You'd probably be excited if you had a $5 million revenue company that was giving you $2 million a year in cash flow. You'd probably be excited about that. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I know you cover a lot of those kind of misconceptions or false narratives, as you say in, in, in your book, but I'd love to talk about more of them because I think that the, they need a lot more exposure. I recommend everyone check out the book as well. Sometimes I'm in the middle of reading. I've still got a long way to go. I've, I've got a long list of books, but I think you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's fascinating. So we talked about Mark Zuckerberg. We talked about Bill Gates. We talked about the YouTube founders. What are some other like really common false narratives? Um, I think that the idea that, um, you know, that you can be this high creative person and not worry about the details, uh, which I have suffered from, um, is, is one of those things. Uh, I think the reality is if you want to start a technology company, you better know how to code. Full stop. That's the business. It's like being a chef saying, I'm going to own a restaurant, but I have no taste buds. Now, what I'm saying is you have to be the best coder, but you have to know enough, right? You, you have to be know enough to be a bad coder and hold your technology team accountable. If you're a technology person and you're starting a company, you have to understand sales. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, that's just what, like, so I think what happens is if you look at understanding sales, marketing, product development, finance, a good founder has to know all of it. They might not be great at it, but they've got to go through like, so this idea that you can just kind of get by and I'll hire people, you know, I always say like, you know what the challenge with hiring the best people is? Why would they work for you? Who are you? Like, who cares about you? No one cares about you. What it makes you so good that the best people in the world want to come work for you. When you're a founder just starting out, nobody cares about you. So you're not going to attract great talent. What you're going to do is attract available talent. You know, and that's why going to college matters, right? There's, there's, there's this, this thing that happens, right? If you go to Stanford and study computer science and you're with a bunch of other nerds, you can go build a company because there's lots of nerds around you, right? There's very capable people around you. If you GED out and work a regular job and decide like, oh, I'm going to start a software company, where are you going to find talent? You end up finding, um, you know, you'll find some guy in, online in India that'll build apps for you. Like, it's like, that's not how that works, right? So I think it's really important uh, to understand how you think about the business you want to be in and be a good student. Don't just like, you know, you, you have a window in time and I'll say like, I don't know your audience. I'm just assuming there's, there's some youngish people in your audience, right? Um, <clears throat> when you're young, there's a moment in time where people will give you the time of day. Like I tell my 22 year old and my 24 year old you know you guys can call any ceo and ask for advice and you'll probably get a meeting there's a moment in time when you're young people the economy wants to help you everybody's rooting for you right the universe is rooting for you humans are rooting for everybody wants you to be successful there's a point in time where people start to root against you <laughs> So it's important to understand where you are in your phase of life and take full advantage. Like a lot of people say, like, I'm 18. Like, why would anyone? I'm like, It's because you're 18. They will spend time with you. If you were 30, they're not going to respond to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm trying to take advantage of. While I'm still 18, I, I reach out to as many people as, as I can. I have chats with them like this thing. It's you mentioned, you know, you give advice to, you know, your your particular kids as well on how to maximize these times of your life. What are some other ways you can maximize? Obviously, you can call anyone, you can email anyone. They're willing to help you, even if you're like, you know, 24, you're still young. You're they're still, you know, kind of rooting for you. What are some other ways you can maximize these times of your life? Um, stop reading business books, 
and read textbooks, right? There are no shortcuts. So if you want to understand marketing, go get a textbook that's used in an MBA school on marketing and read it and understand it. Like there's, there's a lot of foundational uh, stuff, right? That you can do on your own. Like when I was in college, I read the wall street journal, probably every page every day. I made it a discipline, right? So be a good consumer of information and, and don't fall for the like, oh, I'm going to listen to this podcast or I'm going to read this thing. And like, there's no shortcuts. Learn the fundamentals day one because uh, you can do that on your own, right? If you can take a you know, instead of taking racquetball as an elective in college, take a finance class as an elective, right? Um, and so I think those things are like super important if you really want, you know, like I said, you can't outsource everything. You've got to know, you have to at least be mediocre at everything. Hopefully it'll be stellar at one thing and mediocre at the rest of them. Um, and then I think from there is really spend more time talking to people like in many ways, right? So if you think about the internet and the web, right? What did we say? We said, um, the internet's democratizing information, which I think it has. But what does that mean? It means everyone has it. Whatever you can Google, so can everyone else. So where's the information and the edge that's not on Google? That's up here with people. The only way you get it out is by engaging with people. Um, and, and that's how you find your edge. That's where you find your aha moments. Right. Once we all have AI on our phone and it's working well, what edge do you have? You got to know something that AI doesn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to break down a couple of things you said. So the first thing was talent, right? How do you attract great talent? If especially if you're just like a nobody and you're like a young guy and you're just starting out, nobody really you you can only get available talent. You can't really access the best. Uh, sort of a method that's become popular in recent years, you know, and I think, you know, you've got books, you, you're, you're kind of active on the internet. A lot of people seem to think, oh, I can just maybe build a personal brand. You know, I go out there, create content. I, I put myself out there. Maybe that helps me, you know, attract these top, you know, these top tier talent. What do you think about that as an approach, as a substitution maybe to a Ivy League degree or something like that to, to track those people or at least find them, be able to reach out to them? Um, the only way to build an authentic brand is to, to be authentic, which means to attract those people, you have to have some original content, right? You have to know something. Like, here's a good example. Do you know how many people reach out to me to be on a podcast? Like 100 a month. 100 a month. I do like five. Why did I do your podcast? You had a hook. You had a hook, right? Your subject line was a hook. Hey, do you want to be on a podcast with an 18-year-old? Right? That, that's a unique thing, right? If you were 30, I'd be like, who the hell is this guy? I don't know. You want to be on a podcast with a 30 year old? Is that even a thing? Right? So I think what happens is in terms of building a personal brand, one, you have to define like what that's going to be. Two, there has to be some authenticity. You can have some things that are stretch goals, right? Like for example, when you reached out, my assistant usually will ask, I'll send it to her. She will ask about your audience, your reach, how long you've been doing it. Can you send me episodes of your three best episodes? There's a lot of diligence because I don't have time, right? My note to her was just like, hey, make this happen, right? So as you think about that, a great exercise to do, whether regardless of age, right? Draw a Venn diagram of yourself, right? And whether it's, you know, on, on the right side of the page, write your kind of personal character traits that you think are important. On the left side, talk about like industry experience and things like that. And then on the top, talk about like areas of interest, like technology and stuff. And at the bottom, write, write out your aspirations. Then start drawing Venn diagrams around this stuff. 
And what you hope to do is be be um, be in that middle target. Um, I have this theory of monopolies. I think it's in maybe even two of my books, right? Like um, you two can be a monopoly, right? Are you the number one 18 year old business podcaster? Not yet. Probably, Probably. soon. Like maybe, is there someone else? I can't think of anyone. Now that you right, it. you're number one, man. You have monopolized the 18 year old business podcasting business. You're number one, right? Start there, right? Be number one at whatever you do. Now the hack there is like narrow the field. Like you're not the number one podcaster in the world yet. Not yet. Right? <laughs> not yet, right? Um, uh, you, you may not even be the number one 18 year old podcaster in the world. There's probably someone out there podcasting about fashion or something, right? But if you draw the Venn diagram of 18 years old, podcasting, business, you might be number one. And so as you think about that, then you start thinking about, okay, what can I do next? What's my next, um, you know, it's, I would say, like, I think in my book I write about, it's like being a kid and having a lemonade stand. You can be the number one lemonade stand at your home address. Then you can own the block. Then you can own a couple blocks. Then you can own the neighborhood. And then you have to decide, do I want to stay in the lemonade business and just own the neighborhood? Or maybe I add brownies, right? Or do I expand out of my neighborhood and go to the next neighborhood over and keep owning lemonade? <laughs> so you have to like really think about kind of your path and how you think, think about that. Interesting. So it's kind of like if you're building a personal brand, one of the things is like, make a as you said just to summarize what you said like make a venn diagram of who you are everything that makes you you and then that kind of becomes your niche in a sense and so then when you reach out to people and when you're showing yourself <coughs> to the world you're presenting yourself as i'm the number one startup podcaster business podcaster 18 year old in the world because that's my niche that's mm -hmm. very very specifically who i am and Okay, that's really interesting. And then the second thing I want to go back to that you said is this idea of like this information pipeline. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of people tend to go to the same business books, but like instead of that, why not go read textbooks that they give out at Stanford Business School? Read those. You mentioned how, you know, avidly you were reading the Wall Street Journal. What are some other ways you can go about designing that information pipeline, especially because the time we live in, there's so much information out there, so many places you could be learning from. How, where, where do you go personally and where do you recommend your kids go to get their information? Besides the Wall Street Journal? Journal? Yeah, sorry. Besides the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, besides the Wall Street Journal, if you're like a founder, you know you want to build startups, how would you define, <laughs> how would you kind of create that information pipeline? So I think there's, back to like my Venn diagram, right? Think about everything has to do with markets and industry and there is a trade publication or a website or whatever for every industry. So if you decide, Oh, I want to go into the trucking business. I guarantee you there's a hundred publications and conferences around the trucking business. And I think it's really important to understand certain businesses, right? And look, here's another thing, like part of like to your younger audience, um, I've done this with my kids, right? Like, Hey, here's this conference. It's a trucking conference. It's $5,000 for a ticket. Call them up, email them, say, Hey, I'm a student. I can't afford 5,000 bucks. I'll tell you more than half the time they will give you a free ticket. Right. And then you can go to a trucking conference and you sit in all the sessions and you're like, OK. And then at the end of that, you're like, man, this is exciting. I really want to do trucking. Or you walk away going, oh, my God, I never want to see another truck in my life. And so this is where I think um, kind of for the younger entrepreneurs, you know, you got to get out of the building. I, you got to get away from your computer. You got to go out there. You got to go. Um, meet with people. 
I mean, let me tell you, I was at, I was, uh, I'm in San Francisco, outside of San Francisco, and I was at a conference the other day, and one of my co-investors, so when we invest, there's other people that usually invest with us, and my co-investor was speaking, and um, I saw it firsthand, right? Like, we're sitting there talking after his talk. There's like 20 people lined up to talk to him. They don't know who I am because I wasn't on the panel, which was good, um, and all these guys are like, hey, can I have, can I talk to you, can I talk, can I have can I have your email address? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm on, here's my Twitter, right? He's giving out his Twitter handle. He didn't want anyone to have his email address. The young woman comes up to him, like maybe high school, early college. He gives her a business card. Yeah, sure, like love to help you. <laughs> um, so I think there's two things. One, start to figure out your markets. Once you figure out your market markets, do homework on, LinkedIn is an amazing resource. Do homework on people. If you can show up and be very well informed about them and their background, it's not just about flattery. It's about, oh, you cared enough to do the homework about me and my business. So I kind of owe it to you to give you some time. So really, I think while uh, trade publications, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, all those things, right? Those are great sources of information. Another great gold mine, especially today with like ChatGPT and everything, just your ability to break down information pretty quickly. Every public company has what they call 10 Qs and 10 Ks. A 10 Q is their quarterly filing and their 10 K is their annual filing. It's hundreds of pages, right? So you can drop it into chat. Say, summarize this, whatever, whatever. You can, you can get to it. Uh, you can listen to their quarterly calls. So let's say you maybe you don't even care about Meta or Facebook, but Mark Zuckerberg is an aspirational person to you. You should go be on every one of their quarterly calls and listen in. Download their 10Ks or their 10Qs and let, you know, throw it, run it through chat and understand it. So, you know, really study. I mean, the amount of, effort that can go into studying before you have to take a big risk. Like, think about this. All through college, you could be, like, learning all this stuff on your own. By the time you graduate, you're so far ahead of everyone else. And if you decide to do a startup and you're looking for outside funding, it will show when you pitch. The investors will get, like, oh, wow, this person's young, but, man, they have done their homework. they put in the grind, you know, they really have taken the effort, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, KP, I want to take some time to talk about Shadow VC for a second. I know you invest in kind of companies that build things in, in real life, like things that are, are in the world of, of, of atoms, not in the world of bits, as Peter Thiel says. A lot of times I've noticed that a lot of young people are paying attention to the same industries, software, AI, like everyone's paying attention to the same things, but often the biggest opportunities are, are in the industries that people aren't paying as much attention to. Yep. Tell me about what you wish young people would pay more attention to in the world of atoms. What would more young people mm -hmm. would look into and research and maybe try and get into? Yeah, I mean, so the category is called the unsexy. <laughs> Right, the unsexy businesses. Um, I do wish that, um, I think for young people, I think they quickly give up on these old line industries that are unsexy. It's like, I could never be in the airline industry. Like, people just give up. I'm like, that's not true. Like, you could be in the airline industry, but study it, understand it, be creative, come up with a different way of thinking about it, then you too can be in the airline industry, right? So I think there's a little bit of, well, they're already doing that, right? Oh, people are already making cars. Why would I start a car company, right? And I think people give up too early because they think, you know, it's the, the, the incumbency, right? There's an incumbent, right? Um, it's like, it's like, you know, and it's like, it's a generational thing, right? Like you, when you're younger, you have an idea of what you want to do. I get a lot of younger people that are like, I want to be a video game designer. I'm like, great, what do you want to do? Like, I want to go work for Blizzard. I want to go work for Nintendo. I'm like, or you could start your own. 
like, I mean, how would I do that? How would I compete with Nintendo? Right? Like, it's just like, and so I think they're, they kind of give up too early on things because they think someone already owns the space. Yeah, I so I have a bit of a story about that. When I, I was when I was sixteen, I was lucky enough to have my first exit. I started at thirteen, a lot like you did, started building stuff on the internet. And after you know the exit at sixteen, I, I decided to look into some of these unsexy businesses. I decided to build. I was, I was like, you know what? I'm going to build a market research company. I, I, a lot of these big incumbents in the market research space, they sell to a lot of enterprise clients. But like, maybe I could sell some to SMBs. So I get into it, and for two years, I sent over forty thousand emails trying to learn. I was reading McKinsey's presentations. I'm sitting there, just going through what BCG was putting out, just trying to understand. And I was sitting there thinking, man. These guys are decades ahead of me. What am I going to do? That's one of the reasons I started doing these interviews. I was like, oh, well, maybe if I can talk to these SMB decision makers, I can maybe get in front of them, start selling them these reports, at least like get insights into how they make their purchasing decisions. And so that's how this kind of evolved. But I, I was kind of, you know, to be truthful, intimidated by the incumbency, and I didn't know how to think about it. So say you're a young person, you pick an industry, you're like, market research or, or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It could be real estate, yeah. it could be construction, right? What a lot of people don't pay attention to. How do you then think about the incumbents? How do you then approach building a business strategically in those industries? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think you have like you have to be clever, right? And in order, you know, to be, you know, it's a David and Goliath scenario. So you have to be clever, right? Which means you need to study your opponent really well you know when at the venture fund when i'm talking to founders i ask them a couple questions that i think people rarely ask i don't know if it's because it's not popular or what i'm like if you win who loses and a lot of founders have been told like well i mean everyone wins i mean no 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 for you to win someone must lose who are you? And then they're like, oh, okay, well, this is like, so you wake up every morning trying to put them out of business. That's your goal. That's how you win, right? And like, what? What do you mean? No, I'm just going to focus on my client. I'm like, oh, no. If that is your competitor, they may not know who you are right now, but you better know who they are in a deep way. And so like, they'll name like, oh, yeah, this company. I'm like, great. What's the CEO's name? Uh, I don't know. Where do you go to college? Where does he live? How old is he? What's his weaknesses? Where do you, you know, like that kind of like pick them apart and then go beat them. Right. And because they won't see you coming. Because they don't know who you are. Right. And so I think you really have to be strategic and understand like what your limited resources are. Think small at first, like have a big idea, but execute in small increments. And but just really like, you know, obsess about it. Like, you know, uh, look, I think like, like if you think about sports, right, it's, it's both friendly and unfriendly competition, right? But if you're, if you're a defensive, you know, a linebacker, you got the, for the next week, you have the picture of that quarterback on your desktop. Like, that guy, I'm going to, like, sack him every play. Like, you know, that you obsess about, like, I'm going to get that guy, right? It's not a personal thing. It's just how it is, right? And I think you have to obsess about being competitive. Hmm. So, like, for example, right, just to kind of really summarize, make sure I'm understanding this right. Let's say I decide <laughs> to start some construction. I want to go into residential construction. I, that's the business I want to conquer. I want okay. to be the best at it. I want to beat all the incumbents. I go out there and I make a list of the biggest incumbents, the biggest, the baddest, the best. Mm-hmm. And then I go and research their entire management team. Who's their CEO? What, everything about the CEO. What's the story? What, maybe even go interview them. They'll learn about the management team, learn about their founding story. Go look at you know what their customers are saying about them, what the, you know everything about them, everything I can find. Mm-hmm. And in a way, that's going to help me find points that I can attack, and then I can find things that I can do better, cheaper, faster than that, because now I know so much, and that allows me, that depth of information allows me to innovate and and see where others might not see the opportunity, Mm -hmm. and I can go, okay, this part of their business sucks, I'm going to do better, faster, cheaper, boom, I start doing that. Is that, am I kind of getting that approach Yeah, 
And you might decide to go work at one of their, go work for them with the entire goal, right? You might decide to go to one of their job sites for one of their big subdivisions and show up with a food truck and talk to all their workers. And be like, hey, like, yeah, like, it's a great company, right? Yeah, like, I mean, what do you, what do you think they could be doing better? And they're like, oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you, right? One of my favorite newsletters is a company called Hindenburg Research. They basically are short sellers. Yes. So, and my son loves them too. It's, it's just like a fascinating. It a lot of companies. <laughs> yeah. So yesterday they put out a report on uh, Roblox that they were basically false reporting their, um, their monthly active users, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, how do they get that? You know how they get that? They get that because they talked a lot. They're not getting it off the internet, right? I, I don't know for sure. I just know they're not getting it. I mean, they might be having, they might have people hanging out a, at a bar where all the Roblox people go to for happy hours, just eavesdrop. Like, I don't know how they do it. They're doing something different, right? But they're obsessing. You can see, right? They, they see a little bit of chink in the armor and they're like, oh, let me dig in. I'm going to dig in and then I'm going to twist the knife on them, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like, and so I think you have to think that way. You have to have that mindset of like, I'm going to figure like to my point, like, yeah, like in that, in your scenario, get a taco truck, go to a job site, start chatting people up and they will tell you everything. Oh, like, you know, we're actually buying... You know, I wish they would buy better lumber. We tell our customers we're buying great lumber, but it turns out we're buying terrible lumber and it makes my one lumber. It makes my job harder because none of it's straight. And it, I don't think we're delivering a good product for what we're charging. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. And that some matters to you that you, you want to do quality work? Yeah, I mean, like that's that's all I have going for me is to do a great job. And if they're not giving me the the resources to do a great job, I don't want to work here. Like, okay. So then you start thinking like, okay, it's important that we have the best materials, not just to our end customer, but for the workers, because they have pride in ownership, right? They're like, okay, great. scribble that down, right? Like that's the kind of stuff you got to do. Uh, so like find ways to run covert intelligence missions. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Be be like a journalist in many ways, right? If you can reveal what are like what are some ways you've done that maybe for your own startups? It Look, I think you start to build a pattern with big companies. Here's one thing with big companies: you start to figure out what is the easy, the number one resource they have. Money. What is the number one resource they lack? Talent. Speed. Well, talent, right? Which informs speed. Because everybody's got six weeks of PTO and can take six months off for this leave and they have sabbaticals every three years, like all these. And, and by the way, when you're, when you, uh, you know, I work with a lot of very large companies, when you have a hundred thousand employees, can a hundred thousand of them be great? No, they can't. It's just how it is. Right? So you end up with a lot of mediocrity. You end up with a lot of middle management. You know, and so what a lot of founders, I think, when they go try to do business with large companies that they fail on is they don't ask for enough money. And two, they don't think about. So if you go to a big company and you say, hey, I've got this great way of uh, of, of picking quality lumber, right? To your back to your example, I have a great I've built this AI system. You take pictures of the lumber. Uh, and it tells you which ones to pick, right? Making it up, I just created a new business for you. Um, and so the first thing a big company is to say, like, let's run a pilot. As a founder, you might say, oh, let's do it for free. Like, no, 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 no. We're going to charge you for it. Because if you don't charge them for it, it's not going to be important. What they're going to ask you is, like, what do you need from my side? And it's like, oh, well, I need uh, your lumberyard specialist. I need a friend. Like, and then that's when the deal falls apart because in a big company, we know they have a lot of capacity to do things, 
but they can never admit it. They can't admit Steve over there in the cube barely works 10 hours a week. I can add this to his plate. No, Steve is very busy working very hard. He's very busy. So then they think about like, well, how do I resource it to manage you? Where's that time coming from? So that's why they move slow, because even if they have the capacity, they cannot admit the capacity. So they're like, OK, well, we can plan for 2025 to resource Steve to be able to help you. We can plan for that. And so anytime, anytime you could working with big companies, anytime you can ask for more money and less people, you'll always win. Oh, we need our, we need our head of IT to review it with you. Oh, IT is very busy. They're very busy. Always very busy. So much going on. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense. KP, I want to end it off by asking, I love to ask investors about the most notable pitch or most notable meeting they've ever had with a founder and what made it notable. There Are there any stories that come to mind in, in your journey as an investor? Um, I mean, honestly, like every one of my portfolio companies has a great story because I think that's how I engage, right? There's a little bit like, okay, you have my interest now, right? Um, one of the most interesting ones has been Icon 3D. They do 3D printed houses. Um, I met with the founders in Austin in their backyard, right? In their backyard. Um, it was three guys. One of them was more of a technical guy. One's more of a vision guy. One's more of an ops guy trying to do 3D printed concrete houses. And if you, if you look up Icon 3D, they've been on CBS. They're, they're quite famous now. Um, I wrote their first check. But I left there going... I don't know if these guys are going to get anywhere. However, <clears throat> they're very passionate and they're very smart. And what you find out is people that are very passionate and very smart, they find ways to be successful. Um, you have very smart people. Like whenever founders start talking about the money opportunity too soon, I need to know that, right? How am I going to make money? It's an important question. But when they talk about like, yeah, like, like for them, for Icon, the founder was so passionate. It's like, it's insane that everyone in America doesn't have a house. Housing is too expensive. Um, it's not resilient. Why does it take months to build a house? So his old goal was to build a house in 24 hours for $24,000, right? Was his mission. And what kept him up at night, he wasn't talking about how big the market was. And, you know, and now they're, they're huge, right? They're huge now. So I think you're looking for patterns of that because if it's all about chasing money, a founder will give up. It's not easy. Making money is very hard. And a founder, if they're focused on just making money, they will give up way too soon because they're not, and it just doesn't happen overnight. Interesting. So you go meet them. You're in their backyard. What stood out to you? What made you think? You mentioned like the founders are passionate. They're smart. What What did they tell you? What did they say? What did you notice about them that really made you think, huh, these guys, they've got some. They've got the light in their eyes. Yeah. I mean, I think just like the, their why, like their why was very strong. It was very authentic. They did a lot of homework on me. And they were very focused on what value I would add to them because they, they weren't hitting me up for investment. They just wanted advice because there's not a lot of guys, back to the Venn diagram, not a lot of guys that do venture investing, understand technology and knows how concrete works, <laughs> right? There's not a lot of me. So for them, I was like this unicorn advisor because I knew, and I just, I just started a robotics company. So I, so I knew a lot about the tech stack. I knew a lot about the materials and I knew the industry. Um, and they'd done all that homework when they reached out to me and they were like, can we and just, can we just buy you lunch and talk to you, you know, kind of thing. And it was funny. I don't think they expected that I wanted to invest because at that point in time, I hadn't even launched Shadow Ventures really. 
Uh, it's kind of like the the old saying, like when you're looking for money, ask for advice, and when you're looking for advice, ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit. bit. Yeah, it's a little bit of that. But I'd say they did a good job doing their homework, right? Like the if you just said, "Hey, I've got this X Y Z company, and can you come give me some advice?" I'm like, I don't feel like I'm equipped to to really. There's plenty of people that can give you better advice than me. I get that from a lot of founders, right, that are doing something in fintech or some area that I'm not cybersecurity. Hey, can I have a call and give me some? I'm like, I don't, I am the, you don't want my advice. Whatever advice I give you, you should do the exact opposite of it because I know nothing about your industry. <laughs> you know, 